right, uh, we were on page 24, speaking about uh, the Pontificum Magisterium. So yesterday I explained quickly that um, for, for Salaveri, extraordinary and ordinary really is uh, are terms that he will use concerning the mod uh, of the, the documents or of the exercise of the Magisterium of the Pope. So extraordinary, it means what it means, that is, it's something that uh, it doesn't happen commonly, so think about Pope Pius XII uh, calling for, for all the bishops to, um, uh, of the world and to come, I mean at least those who can, and he makes a very solemn definition of the dogma of the Assumption. Uh, something ordinary will be something like an encyclical, for example. If we, uh, uh, I don't know if maybe it's too late for today, but I would like to show the, um, the uh, at least some of it, the, uh, the, the video of um, the uh, proclamation of the dogma of the Assumption, because actually it has been taped, at least to some extent, and it's actually in color. <laughs> uh, so it's interesting to see how it, how it goes, and I think that should be a good um, thing we can do maybe in it tomorrow, uh, so we can have the, the thing ready. And okay, Because uh, it, it's a long video, I mean, it's, I think it's half an hour, so we won't look at all of it, but we can have at least a glimpse as to the solemnity of, of such a definition. So, uh, it's actually that documentary that we have, is, uh, it's on YouTube and it's done by uh, a French-Canadian, actually. Uh, so, the, you have somebody commenting in French, but it's all right, I will... I mean, there is nothing really that you cannot understand, it's just a video of the procession and the pop coming and making the uh, uh, solemn definition. All right, uh, so as infallible decisions of the sovereign pontiffs, we can give as an example the solemn proclamation of the dogma of, um, of the Immaculate Conception by Pius IX in 1854, or the definition of the dogma of the Assumption of Our Lady by Pius XII in 1950 but also the declaration of the invalidity of Anglican orders by Leo XIII. So despite uh, now, I think some modernists are trying to say, oh, it wasn't the definition, it wasn't, you know, basically it's not binding, and we can basically reject it because obviously that's not very good for ecumenism <laughs> if you begin to say that Anglican orders are invalid. So, uh, well, you haven't covered that part of history, it's too bad, but it's a very interesting uh, chapter of history, and I, I hope you will see that soon, uh, where uh, basically there was a controversy because you had in England what was called the uh, Oxford Movement, which was basically like a conservative Anglicanism uh, kind of movement, Oxford Movement. So, and uh, I don't think you put an E in English. Um, is there an E here in English or not? I forgot. Is there is one, okay. So, uh, so a lot of Anglican conservatives who would say today, I suppose, uh, but especially scholars began to read the fathers of the church in particular and they realized basically that, how to say, Anglicanism was absurd. <laughs> so, but some of, them, some of them would realize that, but they would not want to admit it completely. So you had, for example, somebody who is very well known. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how to say his <laughs> name, though. Pussy, Pussy, Pussy? Pusey, all right. Uh, but you had also others who were actually good and converted. So Father Faber, uh, Faber is, uh, is a well-known example of that. He was an Anglican pastor, and then he completely converted and became a great uh, uh, Catholic priest. But uh, anyway, uh, it, that's um, in the uh, 19th century. in England, so it raised the question of Anglican orders because basically those conservatives who did not want completely to leave Anglicanism tried to basically say, hey, look, we are the same, can we just get along? So uh, you had at that point what was named the branch theory that the Catholic Church or the Church of Christ was constituted by not only the Roman Church but also the Anglican Church and the systematics as well. Uh, so that was condemned uh, by actually Cardinal Patrizzi, not to be confused with our dear father here, uh, but <laughs> definitely uh, uh, there is beautiful condemnation <laughs> uh, by Cardinal Patrizzi, but in any case, the, by the Holy See. But in any case, uh, why am I speaking about this? Yes, so the question of the Anglican orders came 
to, to in the public debate because some people were basically trying to say, yes, let's get along. And the Catholics were, well, wait a minute. I mean, they're not even valid. So, you know, they need to need to join the church, need to make a profession of faith, renounce their errors. And if they are clergy, they need to be ordained again. So obviously it makes life a little bit more difficult for them because they have to not only make an abjuration, but also, you know, realize, well, sorry, you're not even clergy. Okay, so, but that's, that's what it is. So in any case, the, the question was raised and uh, submitted eventually to the Holy See and Leo XIII uh, uh, settled that, so he said it's invalid. And particularly because of the intention, in the sense that even if you keep the exact words, if the right is so modified that it does not even include the notion of sacrifice anymore, uh, this, you don't make a priest. It's as simple as that. Which obviously, you know, raises a lot of questions concerning the Novus Ordo um, Mass and Novus Ordo ordinations and the rest of it. The canonization of Saint Pius X, that's a good one, or the definition of a matter and form of a sacrament of orders by Pope Pius XII, Sacramentum Ordinis, which we are studying right now in, in moral theology. Uh, I have put a footnote here, so. Uh, this Dominican theologian gives a list, Schultz, we have it here, so you might want to have a look. Uh, we had it, somebody took it maybe? Oh, here, no, here, okay, right there. So you can have a look for yourself. Uh, so he's, he made the same, pretty much the same list, Pius the Ninth, the dogmatic definition of the Immaculate Conception, uh, obviously the Vatican Council. Leo the Thirteenth, invalidity of the Anglican orders, condemnation of Americanism. So that's by the letter of Testem Bonevolentiae, which was sent to Cardinal Gibbons, who was not the best cardinal ever. Let's put it that way. Uh, do you know what Americanism is, everybody, or not? It's a, like a precursor of modernism. It's, it has, has nothing to do. I mean. I shouldn't say it has nothing to do with being an American. It's, it's a little bit, <laughs> you know, in French we have Gallicanism, so it took the name of Gallia, right? So here in America you have Americanism. It doesn't mean if you are an American you are condemned, obviously. It just means it's an error that was particularly found here in America, which basically is, is a form of liberalism, modernism, and activism. There was a lot of uh, basic idea that, well, you know, who needs to pray? Who needs to be humble anymore? We just need to be practical and build things and do things. Um, so there was a lot of, of that as well. And uh, it uh, it bordered, uh, I mean, there are a lot of things in common with ecumenism, I mean, um, modernism. Like it, it leads to ecumenism and, uh, well, it's a, it's a very much a, an ancestor of, of uh, uh, modernism. But you will study that in history at some point the same class, I suppose, as that one. So, okay, so that one. Then, St. Pius X, condemnation of modernism as heretical in the encyclical Pascendi Dominici Gregis. Very well known, so here you have a Dominican theologian saying this is infallible. The decree of the Holy Office, Lamentabili, which uh, is uh, a little bit like a syllabus, but against modernism in the sense that it's a list of errors of the modernist that were condemned. Okay, that's what lamentably is. And then the formula of the oath against modernism in the motu proprio sacrum antistitum. So the oath that you have to take when you before you be ordained a subdeacon. So you, have, you probably saw that, right? I guess because four of you did it, so you might have seen that. It's very good. <laughs> the, whole, the whole text is just beautiful. Uh, should be indulgence or something. <laughs> Fourth, uh, and this is not me, this is him, you see. To this should be added all the solemn canonizations, obviously. We'll see that later on. It's so clear now to, that to contest that, you really have to be completely dishonest because it's so clear. We, you will see uh, when we cover it. Not only to reject a canonization would be a mortal sin, but it's also v being very dishonest because the infallibility of a church in that regard has been taught so clearly. But we'll see that later on. So let's go back to the text, Pontifical Infallibility, which is thus regar uh, regularly exercised, ensures the unity of faith. So that's the point, that's the goal, that's, uh, that's its reason. Leo XIII in the encyclical Satis Conitum teaches, 
and because it is necessary that all Christians be bound among themselves by the community of an immutable faith. It is for this that, by the virtue of his prayers, Jesus Christ our Lord obtained for Peter that in the exercise of his power, his faith never falters. I prayed for you so that your faith does not fail, which is from the Gospel. So the argument he's making here, if you remember, is the same as St. Thomas Aquinas. It's because the church needs unity of faith that the Pope is infallible. And he ordered, moreover, whenever the circumstances so require, to communicate himself to his brethren the light and energy of his soul. Confirm your brethren. The one, therefore, whom he had designated as the foundation of a church, he wants him to be the pillar of faith. So now I'm taking a, aside uh, one particular thing that he says. He speaks in the quote, if you look, he speaks about... Um, uh, yeah, that in the exercise of his power, his faith never f uh, falters. So he actually speaks about and the forever and wavering and wavering faith. So, okay, well, I put it there actually. The quote: Our Lord obtained from Peter that uh, for Peter should be in the exercise of his power, his faith never falters. This brings us to the question: or whether of whether a pope can fail, fall into heresy, and lose faith. Obviously, this we are going to study more w in, um, when we do the Romano Pontifice, which will be about the papacy, obviously. So we'll see that question in detail. But for now, um, this is more on the side of the magisterium. So can the Pope do that in his magisterium? Let me see, for Peter. If we speak of the possibility for a Pope to fall into heresy as a private person, it is true that not, not all theologians agree. Uh, some say that the Pope can never fall into heresy even as a private person. That is actually the opinion of St. Robert Beramin, for example. But still, because it's not certain, he, still, uh, he will still discuss what about if it does happen. You know? And most theologians do that. Most theologians basically say, no, I, I don't think the Pope could ever fall into heresy, but because it's not absolutely certain, let us examine what if, what if he did. Then what happens? Uh, others claims the, uh, claim the opposite. So there are some who say, no, it's, it's all right, the Pope can fall, no problem. <laughs> uh, but they are all taking here, uh, talking sorry, here about the hypothesis of a Pope falling into heresy as a private person and not in his function as supreme pastor. You will never see any theologian uh, before any SSPX. Uh, whatever. I don't know if you can call them theologians, but in any case, uh, there is no theologian that says, oh yes, the Pope can teach heresy in, in his magisterium, no problem. No, they all speak about the Pope as a private person. So look at the footnote here. This seems to be the more common opinion based on the divine promises of our Lord to St. Peter, although these promises are first directed to the Pope as he is the public doctor of the church. They seem also to simply indicate the personal privilege of not being able to lose the faith even privately. So when our Lord says, I prayed for you, uh, how is it in English, so that your faith does not fail, uh, obviously it, it's first meant as he is the Pope, as he is the supreme pastor, but also you could take it, at least it seems, you could apply it even to the Pope as a private person. A lot of theologians do that, but it's not absolute, it's not certain. So basically, you know, it's just, a, I guess, a pious opinion that you can have. So in the footnote, I say here, see on that question, buoy. So that's here too. He actually references a lot of things. Obviously, you can see here, he has a two-volume two volume, uh, treaty on the papacy. So obviously, it's quite complete. So he will find even the more obscure offers about anything and say what they think or whatever. So it's interesting on in that regard. He's not necessarily like a, a great light like B.O. or others, but he's very good as, uh, in uh, collecting the different opinions and whatnot. So he's very clear that even at his time, for example, the, when the Pope falls into heresy, there were different opinions, very clear. It wasn't settled, the church didn't settle it, and you had theologians that said pretty much anything. So, uh, but we'll see that when we uh, talk about the, 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 the Romano Pontifici. All theologians absolutely agree, on the other hand, that a pope cannot fall into heresy as pope, that is to say, as supreme pastor, when he teaches the church. 
another footnote here. Theologians are divided on explaining what would happen to a pope privately falling into heresy, and the church hasn't settled this question, so I'm sure you know that already. Let us, however, notice, it's just a footnote here to apply that to Paul VI or John XXIII or whatever. Because it's important, because a lot of people will say, oh, he's a heretic because the Unitat is too many. Well, wait, 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 wait. Is that a private thing or is that public? It's public. So if you say he loses the papacy because of heresy, it cannot be the to money. It has to be before. Obviously. Okay? So that's the point I'm making here. Let us, however, notice the following in conformity to what we have said. Even if, by hypothesis, the heretical pope would lose at once the papacy, which is, looks like it is what it makes the most sense, we'll see that, the act by which he would manifest his heresy and lose the papacy must necessarily precede the teaching of heresy as supreme pastor. It makes sense or not? You understand? If you, s if you say, okay, when he becomes a public heretic, he loses the papacy, but at the same time you say, as a private person, but at the same time you say he cannot publish heresy in his public teaching, those two things cannot coincide, meaning it cannot be that in his public teaching he is uh, um, teaching heresy, and as a consequence, he loses the papacy because he would have done it as a pope. You see what I mean? Like it, it, he has to lose the papacy first in order to be able to do that. Does that make sense? It's a very important point. So if somebody says, oh, Bergoglio is not a pope because Amoris Letizia, it's a proof that indeed he's not infallible, therefore he's not a pope, but it's not a proof that he loses the papacy right there. That's not enough. In it, you have to be more logical in the argumentation. For in teaching the church, the Pope is infallible and could not fall into heresy. This would have to happen beforehand. In other words, the act by which a Pope would become a manifest heretic cannot be identical with the act by which he would try to impose heresy on the universal church. The promulgation of heresies and evil disciplines is certainly an infallible sign of absence of authority in a claimant to the papacy, but it cannot be the cause of it, which necessarily must precede such a promulgation. Let our opponents think about that since they often strive to prove that such or such a claimant is a heretic by using examples of public promulgation of heresy. Um, so anyway, that's just something to think about. So one has to be very precise. If you want to make the point that Paul VI or John XXIII is a public heretic, okay, you have to prove that, and therefore not the Pope, you would have to prove that uh, not in his magisterium, obviously, but something before or a private person or something. So, good luck with that. Leo the Thirteenth tells us, quote again, Our Lord obtained from Peter that in the exercise of his power, his faith never falters. Uh, that should be end quote here. It is therefore absolutely impossible for a pope assisted by the Holy Ghost to impose a heretical doctrine on the whole church. That is to say, to impose a doctrine already condemned, for there is a radical opposition between the function of supreme pastor, which consists in confirming the bro uh, brethren or brothers in the faith, and the imposition of a heretical doctrine or of a new religion as we see it today with Bergoglio. And the office of Supreme Pastor is not limited to solemn definitions. It also includes, as we will see little by little, the ordinary teaching of Catholic doctrine, the promulgation of ecclesiastical discipline, the solemn canonizations of saints, and so forth. So we'll see that in the next chapter. So here I'm hinting at what is coming. The Vatican Council in 1870 admirably sums up this doctrine in the dogmatic constitution Pastor Eternus, Quote, uh, the Holy Spirit was not promised to the success of, of Peter so that they might make known under his revelation a new doctrine, but so that with his assistance they holily uh, guard and faithfully display the revelation transmitted by the apostles, that is to say, the deposit of faith. The apostolic doctrine was received by all venerated fathers, revered and followed by the holy orthodox doctors, they knew perfectly well that this seed of Peter remained pure from all error. So it's pretty clear. According to the terms of a divine promise of our Lord and Savior to the head of his disciples, quote, I pray for you that your faith does not fail. And when you will have returned strength from your brethren. So 
this charisma of truth and of faith forever and wavering uh, has been bestowed by God on Peter and his successors in this pulpit. I have to, quote, to check those quotes because I, I, don't, I don't know what he did. So that they fulfill their high office for the salvation of all, so that the universal flock of Christ, separated from uh, food poison with error, be nourished with the nourishment of heavenly doctrine, so that every occasion of season be remo being removed, the church may be preserved entirely in unity, and that established on her foundation, she will stand firm against the gates of hell. End quote. And you see the footnote I put, which is a hint to what is coming. It seems that we could here talk about a certain indefectibility of the faith for the Roman pontiff, in the sense that, at least in his function of supreme pastor, he cannot defect in the faith, not only when pronouncing solemn definitions, but also in as much as when he merely provides guidelines and develops a point of doctrine without yet defining it, he could not contradict an antecedent definition, because otherwise you would have a problem. Basically, the Pope would bind you under pain of mortal sin to adhere to a doctrine which would have been condemned, which doesn't make any sense at all. We are here beginning to touch upon the distinction between infallible truth, so that's when you have an ex cathedra definition, and infallible security or infallible safety, which is the, uh, the case for the uh, uh, Doctrina Catholica, Catholic doctrine, spoken about in the next chapter. So here is only a hint as to what is coming. And we see that in great details, and we're going to give different quotes and distinctions because this question is a little more complicated and subtle. So it's not that, okay, everything that the Pope says becomes a dogma, not at all, or, or begin, you know, belongs to the faith. No, it doesn't. But uh, it's in between. It's in between. So we'll see that. But before we get into this, I would like to quickly um, give you a paper where... It speaks about, it's from Salaveri. It speaks about um, a disputed question, basically whether there is one or two subjects of infallibility. So we look at the scolium one. This is an interesting speculative question. So here, I don't want to give you just a summary. I just I want you to have the whole the whole thing from Salaveri. I gave it to you already. Okay, sorry. Okay, well, you, I guess you have it already. <laughs> I gave you this, I tell you already, it seems. All right, well, you can have it twice, and one or two subjects, <laughs> see? One or two papers. <laughs> so I have given it to you already, okay. Where did I put that? Okay, this paper already, okay. That's what happens when you get old, you forget things. So. One or two subjects. So, <coughs> we said that the, the Pope is infallible, right? We also said the Council is infallible. So, does that mean you have two persons, I mean, more persons, who are infallible, or is it the same? You understand the, where the, the uh, status question is? is? And the answer is, uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> no, the answer is it's disputed a little bit. So, but let's get more precise. Scorion one, is there one subject or in of infallibility or two? The question is about the immediate subject of active infallibility. So remember, uh, for example, if I take a new seminar, uh, Christian, what is the difference between active infallibility and passive infallibility? Do you remember that? We spoke about it like... Uh, two weeks ago or something. Which is why I'm asking, like I wanted to know if you remember. Do you remember, uh, Jason? Uh, yes, so the, the active infallibility is the infallibility of the teaching church, so meaning the Pope and the bishops in teaching the faith. Passive infallibility is the fact that the entire church, the faithful this time, 
uh, cannot all fall into error or heresy. They, they, they will always be faithful Catholic who will hold to the faith, basically. It doesn't mean they can teach with authority, but uh, it means they will not lose all the faith. So is there one subject of infallibility or two? So we are speaking here about active infallibility, that is the one that is uh, for the teaching church. Uh, in defining matters of faith and morals. Among the authors, this question is controversial, but you will see where the Dominican stands. <laughs> so to me, that settles it, but um, anyway. For, uh, one, in this matter, three things must be held as absolutely certain. F one, the Roman pontiff, as the public person of a supreme pastor and teacher of the whole church, is infallible. All right, I hope you know that now. Second, the bishops, as the co uh, college, college, how do you say that? College of the whole teaching church under the Roman pontiff agreeing in proposing a doctrine to be held and believed by all are infallible. All right, so that covers two things the, the council, the communical councils, and also in their uh, universal ordinary magisterium. Third, the College of Bishops, as a subject of infallibility, is not adequately distinct from the Roman pontiff. It's not adequately distinct. What does it mean? Well, in the College of Bishops, you actually have the Pope right there. You understand? So it's not two things that are uh, completely separated, distinct. All right? Because in order to be such a college, necessarily and essentially, it must include uh, its head, which from the institution of Christ is the successor of St. Peter in the primacy. We have demonstrated these three points in the preceding uh, thesis. <laughs> so uh, this is an important question. Why? Because, for example, when you refute collegiality, you better be very precise, because otherwise you might actually end up saying that something is heresy, which is actually taught by certain theologians. So you see? Uh, so this is a little bit of a tricky equation. Second, the disputed question is this. Whether the College of Bishops with the Pope and under the Pope on the one hand and on the other hand, the Pope himself, as a public person, are they two immediate subjects of infallibility inadequately distinct? Or is the immediate subject of all infallibility of a church, the Roman pontiff alone, through whose mediation infallibility is derived to the body of bishops as coming from the head to the members? Do you understand the, the status question is or not? Not, not, you're not too sure. Well, you have the Pope. Let's see. All right. And here you will have uh, the bishops, College of Bishops. All right. So they are both infallible. So that means, all right, they get infallibility from God. But the College of Bishops includes the Pope, right? The Pope is part of the College of Bishops. So how do they get their infallibility? Is it like that or is it like that? Do you understand the question? It's neither of us. <laughs> like it's not you know, that kind of way, but... Uh, um, All right, opinions of the authors. So you can see that uh, sometimes in theology, things are actually disputed. <laughs> no, I mean, it's everywhere. Number one, these hold that there is one immediate subject of infallibility, the Roman pontiff. Palmieri, Dominican, Billot, who's actually a Jesuit, uh, Straub, I don't know who is, Wilmers, the Groot, he's there also, Munconil, and then you have different names that uh, probably will destroy, Mikrosigists, Probably Nico can say that for us. Mik Mikhailic. Mikhailic. Uh, Zapelena, who is also a, a Jesuit, so you can see that you have different uh, uh, literature. And I think it's Du Blanchy. I think it's a mistake in the translation. Let me see. I have the original here. Whoever. That's why the translations are not good. And uh, never. When you have a when you have to buy a, a theology book, buy the Latin. Don't buy the English, because uh, this is what happens. Du Blanchy. Du Blanchy with an H, please. And many others. Second, these defend the, uh, the view that, uh, and this is a little bit eaten, 
Where's the other? All right. Uh, these defend the view that they are two immediate subjects of infallibility inadequately distinct. Uh, Churchia, Pesch, Mazzella, Clodgen, Clod I don't know, Franzelin, uh, Sheenan, Herter, Schieben, Spassil, Benvel, Dorsch, De Guibert, Marotto, Stolz, Zubizarreta, Rufino, and many others. So the big names in those are Mazzella, Franzelin, and Zubizarreta. Maroto is like more a canon lawyer. I, s I, don't, I don't know why he includes here. The following do not take a position. <laughs> uh, Derbigny, Schultz, Felder, the, S the Sun, I guess, Van Laag, Van Noort, Veliko, Dickman. Dickman is a good theologian. We have it there. Uh, here. Dominican. However, the latter, uh, latter author says that he leans more to the opinion of one subject of infallibility because he's uh, Dominican. <laughs> Uh, so you see that you have big names on both sides. So, yes. Uh, he's a Jesuit, I believe. We have it here, so I can check that quickly. But I'm pretty sure he's a Jesuit. Hmm. Let's see. It doesn't actually say. Camillus Mazzella, he was a cardinal, all right. Polymen Pontinia. He was teaching in the Gregorian University, which is the one of the Jesuits, right? Well, it doesn't say in the book. That's a little odd. Why would you hide that? <laughs> Maybe he wasn't. Hmm, maybe it wasn't, maybe uh, I'm confusing. Uh, he was a cardinal anyway. So he's, I mean, he's somebody who is very eminent. S for some reason I thought he was a Jesuit, but I guess I have a doubt now. Maybe we can look it up quickly. Balash? He was a Jesuit, okay. All right, thank you. <coughs> Uh, all right, so you see that you have big names on both sides, so, you know, we can discuss about it, but obviously, you know, you're not going to call a heretic somebody who uh, disagrees, obviously. I mean, actually, I don't know, now it's become the way to go, it seems. Uh, fourth, in Vatican Council one, so the first Vatican Council, both opinions were freely defended. So that's another thing, is that they actually discussed that quickly at, at Vatican one, and basically, they didn't settle it. So if, if imagine if the Ecumenical Council of the Church didn't settle it, what are you going to do? You know? For the Secretary of, for the Faith, Bishop Gasser, in the General Congregation on July 11, 1870, said, quote, the decrees on the faith published by the General Council are not infallible unless they have been confirmed by the Pope. The reason for this matter is not that which, and I say this with sorrow, has been declared from this pulpit, namely, so basically somebody came before and defended the first uh, thesis, Namely, as if all infallibility of the church is situated in the Pope alone and is derived from the Pope in the church and communicated to her. But how could infallibility be communicated? This I do not understand. Hence, Gasser held for the twofold subject of infallibility. In the same Vatican Council in the General Congregation on July 16th, that is, two days before the first dogmatic constitution on the church, was promulgated in the solemn fourth session, the other uh, secretary for the faith, Bishop Zinelli, after mention of a twofold opinion of the authors concerning the subject of infallibility, and in the name of the Committee for the Faith declared, quote, this is not the place to proclaim anything completely determined about this matter, but it must be openly stated that in no way has a decision been made about this question, nor can an anath anathema be applied to those who hold either one of these opinions. So, there you go. Uh, five. Therefore, both opinions, even after the Vatican Council, can be freely maintained. In my view, the opinion holding, so that's Salaveri speaking now. In my view, the opinion holding that there is one subject of infallibility can be defended better with speculative arguments, but the positive arguments favor rather the opinion about the twofold subject of infallibility. So basically, he's saying if you look at speculative theology, if you think about it, it makes more sense to say there's only one subject of infallibility. But if you look at positive things like quotes from 
from people or uh, history, it seems to indicate rather the twofold subject. That's what he says, basically. Usually, speculative gets it right, though. I will tell you that. Uh, because many times, it, sometimes people, when they speak, are not that precise, but it doesn't mean they disagree with something. Those who hold that there is only one subject of infallibility say that the absolute firm faith from Christ can be predicated of Peter alone, and therefore that the decrees of the council obtain their absolute value only from the confirmation of a successor of Peter. However, so uh, instead of saying that from the fact that the bishops also are there, however, speculating further on the nature of the unique supreme power on earth of the vicar of Christ and stressing the meaning of the metaphors of the rock, of the key bearer, uh, of the pastor of all, and of the one who confirms his brothers, they conclude probably that this supreme office in the church, by its very nature, demands that only through his mediation can, can infallibility itself be attributed to others. Now, an interesting thing, though, is that, uh, and I don't know if you will address that, but Pope Pius XII, because this is not that old, so he should... Because infallibility is, is linked with authority, right? But pos uh, and, and it, it was disputed as to how the bishop got their authority. Basically, they got it from Christ, that's for sure. But because the bishops are not just vicar of the Pope. They have an ordinary jurisdiction in their diocese. They truly are the, the pastor of their, of their diocese. And the Pope is the pastor of the universal church, but they're not just vicar, like you are a vicar in a parish where you have no jurisdiction, but you're just delegated. Everything you do depends on the, on the, the pastor, the parish priest. Okay? It's not the same relationship between the, the, the bishops and the Pope. So, uh, because of that, it always was disputed as to how they got their authority. Well, it was coming from Christ, that's for sure, but would it come through the Pope, through the mediation of the Pope? So, Pope Pius XII actually settled that question. He said, yes, it comes through the Pope. So, it seems, in my opinion, that you could make the point that the, then that question also is solved for the same reason by Pope Pius XII, in the sense that infallibility and authority go together. Do you understand what I mean? It's just my two cents on that, but it seems to me you could make the point that now, with the teaching of Pope Pius XII, it's pretty much settled, but let's, let's move on anyway and see what the other says. Those who defend uh, the twofold subject of infallibility inadequately distinct uh, Well, that's not better. <laughs> all right. It's a little bit cut here. First of all, urge that there is a twofold promise of infallibility made directly and immediately by Christ. One to the person of Peter, but the other to the more person of the College of Apostles. And you have the reference here. So the promise to St. Peter is the one that everybody knows. Uh, the promise to the College of the Apostles, Matthew 18, 18. So let me probably just give you one or two. But he does say, you know, uh, the, to, to the Apostle as a group, basically, he who heareth you, heareth me, and so forth and so on. You see, he doesn't say that just to St. Peter. That is true. But if I wanted to argue against him... <laughs> uh, Let's see, Matthew 18, 18, right? Matthew 18, 18. So, what is it? Uh, Amen, I say to you, whatsoever you shall bind upon earth shall be bound also in heaven, and whatsoever you shall lose upon earth shall be loosed also in heaven. He was speaking to, the to, the, to, the, to the, all the apostles here. So he said that to St. Peter alone, but he also said it to the apostles. You see? So basically, the argument is, well, look, there's two fault promises, or there are two promises, actually. Uh, but, you know, I would argue against that, that, well, yeah, well, I mean, obviously, they are infallible. We're not saying that they are not infallible, but the Pope has to be there. So it doesn't really, in my opinion, it doesn't really prove anything. Hence, they conclude that one must hold that both promises obtain their effect with equal immediacy, lest the meaning of Christ's words for the, uh, to the apostles might seem to be weakened. Furthermore, they argue that the opinion of a twofold subject of infallibility is more in harmony with a sense of a church and of a traditional way of conceiving this matter, as the history of the ecumenical councils daily makes more clear. Finally, the Orientals... 
uh, that, as far as positive says, doesn't mean people from Asia. It means uh, obviously the uh, the uh, uh, Eastern Europe mainly and uh, this part of the world. Erring in good faith, are opposed to the opinion of one subject of infallibility, and especially turned away from the desired union with Catholics, since this view is not easily reconciled with the histor historical facts, nor does it explain sufficiently why the bishops in an ecumenical council are said to be not, more, uh, not mere counselors, but true judges of the faith. So here are some arguments given by Franzelin, for example. Um, and that is true in the sense that at the end of uh, a council, they all sign and they basically say that they judge the faith. So that is true, that they are truly judges of the faith in an ecumenical council. <coughs> uh, the thing he says about the Oriental serving in good faith, um, I would you know, take that with a grain of salt in the sense that if you see the history of this season, I mean... People, I mean, I, I would grant that there are some people in good faith, but it's not as if like they couldn't know better or something, as a whole. Uh, six, on the supposition of a twofold promise of Christ, infallibility as such depends totally on the divine assistance, but the assistance of God seems to touch in an equally immediate way both the Pope speaking as cathedra and the Council agreeing with the Pope in defining some dogma. Therefore, given the twofold promise, it is easy also to admit a twofold subject of infallibility inadequately distinct. So here you have again a footnote with Bishop Zinelli, who, speaking in the name of the Committee for the Faith, um, from the twofold immediate promise of Christ, one to the college with its, uh, its head and the other made to Peter alone, concluded in general that in the church there is a twofold subject of supreme authority, saying, Quote, we admit that full and supreme power truly exists in the supreme pontiff as the head, and that the same full and supreme power truly is also in the head joined together with the members, that is, in the pontiff with the bishops. So you see, he clearly says it's the same argument, basically, infallibility, authority, obviously. The reason why the, super, the, the ecumenical council is infallible is because it exercises supreme authority for the entire church. Which goes back to the point I was making that now Pope Pius XII has very clearly said the bishops get their authority through the mediation of the Pope. So to me, that question is actually settled, but that's only my opinion on that. I'm not friends in, obviously. Uh, okay, so he was saying that. And further, because these two subjects of supreme power are not adequately distinguished from each other, because the bishops in no way can obtain the supreme power without the head. He rightly concludes that there cannot be any conflict between the two subjects. So after that, which is already a question quite difficult, <laughs> add to this now collegiality of Vatican II. And try <laughs> well, not now. <laughs> Therefore, by reason of the immediacy of the assistance of God, the infallibility of the Pope and uh, uh, what? and the infallibility of the teaching church must be said to be the same thing, as it seems uh, will be made clear from the following analysis when we have considered the act, cause, assistance, and meaning of the infallible definition of both subjects. An act of pontifical infallibility is a solemn judgment of the person of a Pope speaking ex cathedra, the cause of this infallibility is the assistance of God, who, by his providence, brings it about that the Supreme Pontiff correctly conceives and aptly, uh, aptly expresses the truth of faith and morals, which he defines ex cathedra. Therefore, the assistance of God must touch immediately the person alone of the Pope and terminate in his act alone of judging ex cathedra. The meaning, therefore, of a doctrine so defined must be drawn from the words used by the Pope and the intention had by the Pope himself in making the definition. All right, now a look at uh, conciliar declaration. An act of conciliar infallibility is the consensus of the members. Uh, I will go back to. Uh, members of a body <laughs> joined together and with the head in a solemn judgment by which they define a doctrine. The act of consensus as such essentially requires that its subject consists of various physical persons, namely the Pope and the bishops. 
The cause of uh, this infallibility is the assistance of God who, by his providence, brings it about that the bishops agree with each other and with the Pope in rightly conceiving and aptly expressing the truth of faith or morals that they define in a conciliar way. Therefore, the assistance of God must touch immediately both the Pope and the bishops who agree in judging, and it terminates in uh, their solemn judgment. Although it is in different ways, according as the terminus demands in which the assistance is received, for the assistance terminates immediately both in the Pope as the head and in the bishops as members of the body, because in agreeing on the definition, both the Pope as head and the bishops as members are, uh, as true judges, have their own proper act. The meaning, therefore, of a doctrine defined by a council must be deduced from the words and intention, not only of the Pope, but also of the bishops, from which their consensus can be discovered concerning the doctrine which they define solemnly. But I don't see any problem with that, uh, with the, this theory. I think I don't see any contradiction. Anyway, just be aware of that dispute here, especially when, uh, hopefully later, we have a discussion about collegiality. Uh, in principle, the bishop always wanted to have a, a class on Vatican II, so hopefully we'd get that done someday. Because you see that uh, this sounds a lot <laughs> like certain interpretations of Vatican II, so you have to be careful to make sure you don't confuse it with something actually allowed by the Church. All right. Uh, so is that clear enough for the dispute? I, I'm not asking you to settle that discussion, obviously, just to be aware of the discussion. But again, I think it's something that is worth it to, to be deepened. In a sense, uh, I would like to see if, after Pope Pius XII made that statement, um, if there is any theologian who commented on that and drew the conclusion concerning this dispute. That would be interesting to see. For the authority, yes, uh, they, they took that into account, but I have never seen somebody actually applying it to the question of infallibility, which, uh, in my opinion, would be the same anyway. All right, so let's move on with something very important and very interesting, because it's usually not spoken about. The question of a simply authentic magisterium, chapter 4. So, the, the, that, that's page 27 in your notes. <coughs> The previous chapter considered the pontifical magisterium in its supreme degree, that is, in its definitive and infallible decisions. But the duty of a sovereign pontiff to confirm his brothers, like our Lord asked him to do, in the faith, uh, according to the order given by our Lord, is not restricted to these definitions, obviously. And we are now going to discuss the question of knowing which kind of assent is due to decrees and teachings of a sovereign pontiff which are not ex cathedra definitions, so typically everything contained in encyclicals, uh, for example, when it's not infallible. This question is related to that of the teachings of a universal ordinary magisterium, which are not definitive, as well as that, uh, sorry, as well as to that of a kind of assent due to the doctrinal decrees of the Holy See, like uh, any, I mean, yeah, a decree coming from the Holy Office, something like that. Are we free to just reject it? Or should we obey? What kind of obedience do we need to give to it? Is it just okay to ignore it but not rebel openly or what? Uh, so you have a, a footnote here saying, this question is also related to that of the infallibility of the universal disciplinary laws of a church in the sense that one is certain in following them of not putting oneself in danger regarding faith or more. So uh, this is my footnote. It's my two cents on that. It's for me, the principle is the same. Meaning, if you follow an order of the church in discipline, you cannot put your faith or morals into danger. So it makes sense that you would apply the exact same principle to, uh, to doctrines that are imposed, to which you are actually bound to adhere, even though they are not yet infallible. That in doing that, you could not put your faith into danger. That would make sense, no? Because it's an order. It's, uh, in a way, it's a doctrinal discipline in the sense that it's not defining something of faith, but it's imposing it on you. Just like the church can impose canon law, can impose a liturgy, and so forth. Right? So that's why I'm saying it. In my opinion, there is a link. 
these universal disciplines are practical applications of a doctrine and in this way transmit a teaching of a universal magisterium which enjoys infallible uh, safety explained in this chapter. So we're going to speak about that a little bit. Universal disciplinary laws thus fall under the secondary object of infallibility as we shall see uh, later. And that would be a very interesting chapter as well. So, I mean, the more we go now, the more it's going to be interesting. <laughs> Uh, so the goal of this chapter is also to establish whether or not the Apostolic See further enjoys a special assistance of the Holy Ghost in these kinds of decisions, and in this case, to study the manner in which this divine assistance is exercised. So the problem is, obviously, today a lot of people will say, yes, 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 we agree the, the Pope is assisted by the Holy Ghost, but only when he makes ex cathedra pronouncement. The rest of the day, the Pope is left on his own. Is that... Does that make sense? No, it doesn't. So we'll see that tomorrow. 